All right, we are continuing our study of the Gospel of Matthew here on the Listener's Commentary. And in this recording, we're going to be looking at Matthew 26, verses 17 through 30. And let's just keep the flow of the story in mind where we're at here in Matthew's Gospel. Chapter 26, coming out of the last major teaching block, announced that Jesus was about to be crucified and connected it closely with Passover. Passover is two days away, Jesus says, and the Son of Man is going to be betrayed and crucified. And then Matthew recounted how the chief priests and the leaders there in Jerusalem were looking for a way to kill Jesus. They wanted to do it secretly and on the sly because they didn't want to stir up the crowds and create a riot. And so as they're trying to figure out a way to make that happen, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus, Judas himself, comes to the chief priest and offers his services and basically says, what will you give me to hand Jesus over to you? And they give him 30 pieces of silver. And Judas then begins to look for a good moment. When can I hand him over? When can I entrap Jesus? When can I hand Jesus over to the leaders? Well, that's where we pick up here in verse 17. We've got all of that as backstory. And now it's Passover time in Matthew 26, verse 17. And so the text reads, Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? So it's important to remember that Passover is also associated with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, so much so that in the first century, you could refer to them by the same name. Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they went together in their experience and in the way they talked about things. And so they want to know, where can we prepare a Passover meal for you? What's the place here in Jerusalem for that? And Jesus says to them in verse 18, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I'm keeping the Passover at your house with my disciples. And so it sounds as if Jesus made certain arrangements with this particular person uh, that will understand, Okay, here we are. I'm, I'm ready now to prepare the Passover. Luke's account of this actually indicates some very specific arrangements that Jesus had made ahead of time. Let me read the way Luke describes it in his gospel. It says this, And so Jesus sent Peter and John, those are the two that are going to go into the city, Peter and John saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. And they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare it? And he said to them, When you have entered the city, a certain man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. And the reason that would have stood out is because typically females would have drawn water. So this, this seeing this man would have said, okay, there's the guy. That's going to be the clue. Follow him to the house that he enters. And you shall say to the owner of the house, the teacher says, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upstairs room. Prepare the Passover there. So those are the indications. That's the details that Luke gives us that Matthew just kind of summarizes here. They will see a specific person carrying a water jar, follow him to the house, prepare the Passover there. So verse 19, the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. So they're setting the table, right? So you got to make sure you picture the scene. Uh, Typically, it's a low table with benches or couch type cushions around three sides of it. That's where they're going to recline and eat this Passover. And they're preparing the meal. They're getting all the arrangements, everything set. And so once they have everything set, they're ready for Passover. So verse 20 says, now when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the 12. And so Jesus and his 12 apostles are all gathered around this table reclining on their side, feet out behind them, uh, propped up on one elbow and enjoying this meal. And the Passover was an evening meal and it lasted for several hours. We're not actually told much about this particular meal that they eat together. We're only told a few key details that focus on what really is for Matthew and the other early Christians, the most important part the part where Jesus explains the meaning of his death and he associates it with the Passover feast and how he's inaugurating a new covenant. And that death, recall, is going to happen in the next 12 to 15 hours. And so there they are reclining at the table together, eating this meal 
on the eve before the culminating events of Jesus' life and God's saving work through him. And in what follows, Matthew describes two events that happen at the meal. The first is the warning of a betrayer, and then the second is the part where Jesus explains the meaning of his death. And so here's how it unfolds, verse 21. As they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. Being deeply grieved, they began saying to him, Each one, Surely it's not I, Lord. Remember, these are his closest friends. They've spent the last three, three and a half years almost with him daily, following him everywhere, listening to him teach. And now he has just said, truly, one of you is going to betray me. And in their cultural context, to betray someone that you had been that intimate with, that you had eaten with, that you had done life with, deep-seated betrayal. And so they're all like, it's not me. No, who is it? Not I. And he answered and said to them, He who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. Now, the Passover meal involved a series of phases with different moments to drink something from the cup and to dip something and eat. And so it was a complex meal with all sorts of drinking and dipping and eating. And so there would be various parts to the meal and various bowls for dipping all set around. And so this could simply mean someone at this table who has eaten with me. It It could be that generic. Or it could mean... Uh, Judas specifically, who's right ne- was right near him and maybe even dipped in the same bowl that he was dipping in. We're not really sure. Mark's account actually keeps it very general. But either way, whether it's intended to identify someone sitting right next to Jesus, as if Judas is right there and uses the same bowl for the dipping uh, that Jesus uses, or it's more general, the point is how deep this betrayal is. This is somebody who is close to Jesus and who has shared life with Jesus and who has eaten with Jesus. And so it's the one who has dipped his hand in the bowl with me. And then Jesus says in verse 24, the son of man is going away just as it is written about him, just as the scriptures said would happen to the son of man. But woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Imagine being around that table, not knowing exactly who the identity of the betrayer is and hearing these words. Imagine being Judas at that table and hearing these words. Uh, So it's going to happen. The scripture foresaw it and foretold it. But the person who is responsible for it, well, he is culpable. He really is accountable for his action. And it would have been good if he had not been born. And Judas, verse 25, who was betraying him said, Surely it's not I, Rabbi. I love the way Matthew tells this story in this moment, in this kind of somber words of Jesus. Now Matthew inserts the words of Judas in his protest. Surely it's not I. And Jesus said to him, You've said it yourself. In other words, Jesus knows it's Judas. And now Judas knows that Jesus knows, and the depth of this betrayal is strong. And so this Passover feast is marked by themes both dark as well as celebratory. There's betrayal, there's suffering, there's death, but there's also an invitation to join Jesus and the coming of the kingdom of God and a new covenant. And so now we turn in verse 26 to this this key moment, this culminating central part of this Passover feast, what we call the Lord's Supper, where Jesus then kind of reassociates this meal with not just their longings for a new exodus, but saying it's happening in himself and in what's about to happen in the next handful of hours. Look at verse 26. Now, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after saying a blessing, he broke it, And he gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. What's really important to notice is that Jesus alters the traditional blessing of the bread by saying that this bread symbolizes him and what's going to happen to him and specifically to his body. And then as a result of that, through him. 
And so just as he broke the bread, so his body is going to be broken. That seems to be the implication. And at the Passover, Jewish interpretation of the bread usually stated something like this. This is the bread of affliction of our ancestors that they ate when they came out of Egypt. And so they understood the bread that they were eating wasn't literally the same bread that their ancestors ate, but it represented that bread. And it enabled them, therefore, to relive and in some certain way re-experience that great event. Well, now Jesus takes that very blessing and that very bread and offers a new understanding, not centered on the original Passover and the original Exodus, but a new Exodus and a new Passover now focused on his body. And so just as Passover was a reliving, if you will, of God's deliverance of Israel out of Egypt, so now this new interpretation of this meal offered by Jesus is a representation and a reliving of God's saving work through the sacrificial death of Jesus. This is my body. And then verse 27, when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is being poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, we don't know for sure, but this is most likely the third Passover cup, which came after the meal. And once again, Jesus reinterprets it and gives it a new symbolic meaning revolving around his death. And Jesus says, just as the cup was poured out, so his blood will be poured out. And notice that he calls this the blood of the covenant. This phrase, blood of the covenant, echoes Exodus 24, 8, where the Sinai covenant was ratified in a ceremony with, the, with blood sprinkled on the people. And Jeremiah promises that God would make a new covenant. Jeremiah 31, and the book of Hebrews, tells us that that new covenant is ratified with the blood of Jesus. And so here we have this new covenant being ratified by the pouring out of Jesus' blood, and it'll achieve, he says, the forgiveness of sins. That's the goal that it's being offered for, is to bring about release and forgiveness of sins and the punishment that's due to it. And the word many, notice that, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins, probably in that many is just a little echo, a small allusion to Isaiah 53, where the suffering servant lays down his life for the many, for a large group of people is the idea. And so Jesus, by bread and by cup, is basically saying, here now when you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you're once again re-experiencing, reliving my self-giving love and my sacrificial death on your behalf. Just like Passover was this reliving of that moment of deliverance from Egypt, so now this new feast is focused on me and it inaugurates and ratifies the new covenant in my blood. Jesus goes on in verse 29 and says, But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on, until that day when I drink it with you, new in my Father's kingdom. The phrase fruit of the vine is traditional Passover language for the blessing of the wine. And so it suggests that what Jesus means is that this is his last Passover meal with them. That's what he's getting at. And so he's really saying that he's not going to eat or drink like this again until the kingdom of God comes. But he's inviting them to eat and drink as this way of uniting with him and recalling him. And then after this invitation and after this new symbolic interpretation of this meal, it says in verse 30, they sang a hymn. They sang a traditional song of praise and worship and blessing to God. And then they went out to the Mount of Olives, which is where they were going to stay for the night. So here, at the culmination of his ministry and his mission, Jesus gave a symbol-laden meal. That's what he gave to them, to remember him and to re-experience his goodness and his love by his self-sacrifice. He gave them bread and he gave them wine, a tangible, experiential way to re-experience this on an ongoing basis. And we know how central this was for the early church and the church throughout all of history still to this day, how 
you see in the book of Acts that they did this at least weekly. Seems more often than that. Whenever they were together, as Jesus said, they took this. They took bread. They took wine. They re, not just remembered, but they also relived, re-experienced Jesus and his love and his self-sacrifice. That somehow, by his self-giving love and his death, Jesus achieved a new exodus, a new deliverance, not just from the bondage of Egypt, but from the bondage of sin and death and the powers of evil. And so, every time we're gathered together as people and we take the Lord's Supper or communion or the Eucharist, whatever your tradition calls it, every time we're together, what we're really doing is we have this incredible opportunity to taste and see that the Lord is good. And the early church took this opportunity very seriously and they celebrated as often as they gathered together. It was a key part of their worship. And in a very real sense, it ought to be a key part of our worship today. And sadly, it isn't always that in every tradition. But I have seen encouraging signs that more and more traditions, depending on their background, more and more are saying, you know what, we want this to be central to our life together as a way to represent, relive, and re-experience the goodness of God in the person of Jesus. And that's what Jesus offers us in this simple little act of communion or blessing and thanksgiving, Eucharist, that we take on a regular basis as his people. All right, thanks for tuning in to this session of the Listener's Commentary on the New Testament. The Listener's Commentary is made possible by the generosity of folks just like you. So thanks a ton for your support. And uh, if you want to join the team of supporters best way to do it is to swing over to listenerscommentary.com. You can click the Give button, or you can even sign up for the Study Hub. Either way is a great way to support this ministry. All monthly donors get access to some online courses as well as some bonus material that I put inside the Study Hub. Thanks a ton for your support.